is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 28th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our approach is a bit different. In the first segment, we talk about our top one for the week, the fundamental misstatements included in two recent no on one op-eds. But in the second segment, instead of doing our normal two and three of the weekly top three, Michael instead channels recent listener questions, which largely challenge why we have turned from a cuts only fiscal approach we advocated up until the late 2010s to a fiscal approach which now advocates a mix of cuts and new revenues. And now let's join Michael. So uh, we've got one big topic here, and uh, this is uh, this is a big one, and I know that it's one that many of my listeners disagree with, uh, is the discussion on the proposition, ballot proposition number one, which of course is the oil tax credit. Now, initially you were against it. Uh, you have since turned around and come back and said, no, nope, I, uh, I think I'm in favor of it, which has, again, thrown some people for a loop. But uh, give us some clarification here. You said there's some misleading statements coming out here, and I want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, we're, get, we're getting into the funny season on, uh, on, on Prop 1, uh, where people are spinning facts, alleged facts, uh, on both sides and making their arguments uh, based on these facts. But it turns out the facts aren't facts. Uh, and this week, uh, especially, I think it's been the no on one's turn in the barrel uh, to sort of make things up and, and, and try to spin their argument off of, off of things that just aren't true. Uh, and and my, my, my hope is for listeners to be discriminating when they read these op-eds on both sides, but, uh, but to be discriminating on both sides when they when they read these op eds because because they're just making they're, they're starting to make stuff up as they go along uh, to, uh, to, uh, to to support their point. There's two examples uh, this week that I think are are important because of the people who wrote the op eds uh, and because of just the blatant uh, uh, misstatements that are contained in the op eds. The first is. Uh, an op-ed that ran in the Fairbanks News Miner. It may have run in others. I haven't, I haven't seen it run in others. Uh, but it was authored by former Governor Frank Murkowski um, and, and talks about uh, uh, Prop 1 uh, under the title, uh, The Permanent Fund Dividend is at Risk. Well, we, we've talked about that general proposition before, about whether Prop 1 actually uh, puts the dividend at risk. It doesn't. Actually, Prop 1 helps support uh, the dividend uh, in the current term. A yes on one helps support the dividend uh, in the in at least in the near future. But but in this in this um, op ed, uh, Murkowski goes through his argument, and then there's a paragraph that says this: the ballot measure will be before voters in November. Uh, the, the ballot measure that will be before voters in November is primarily through the efforts of those who continually lit- continually litigate against the oil industry. It will not be able to be amended to correct errors for two years. And, and from that, uh, Frank goes on and says, well, you know, we need to vote against it then because we're not going to be able to correct these errors and it's going to be subject to litigation and things are going to go on and on and on from, from that. He's not right. I mean, he's wrong about it, in the statement that it will not be able to be amended to correct errors for two years. And it doesn't, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out he's wrong. You just simply go to the Constitution. Okay. Um, 
Section 11 uh, or, or Article 11, Section 6 talks about uh, uh, ballot measures. It says if a majority of the votes cast on the proposition favor its adoption, the initiated measure is enacted. If a majority of the votes cast on the proposition favor the rejection of an act referred, it is rejected. The lieutenant governor shall certify the election returns. Now, here's, here's the critical part. An initiated law becomes effective 90 days after certification is not subject to veto and may not be repealed by the legislature within two years of its effective date. That's, that's what Frank's grabbing hold of. But here's the sentence that follows that in the Constitution. It, the ballot proposition, may be amended at any time. So... You know, Frank makes this whole argument based upon the, the, the statement that uh, the ballot measure will not be able to be amended to correct errors for two years. The Constitution says the ballot measure may be amended at any time. And frankly, that's a key point of my argument about why I think uh, uh, Proposition 1 is acceptable. Uh, I, think, I think it's acceptable at the, at the revenue levels that it produces. I don't think it's going to have an adverse effect on the industry. It's certainly not going to have an effect, adverse effect uh, on the PFD. But if that's wrong, if, if we start getting into the next year, the next, the next two years, and we see that it does have an adverse impact on, uh, on investment levels and it may have an adverse impact on future revenue streams, uh, then the Constitution clearly provides it can be amended uh, at any time by the legislature. And the legislature has certainly shown that, that it knows how to amend um, uh, uh, oil tax acts. So, it, I mean, Frank's just wrong. I, I don't know who gave him legal advice uh, uh, when he was putting together the op-ed or if he was just going from memory, but he's just absolutely wrong. Right. Prop one can be amended at any time. Well, and this is part of the problem. Again, there's been uh, some outrageous assertions on both sides of this issue. You and I have talked about both sides coming out with things that are, you know, full, you know, fictitious, fallacious, whatever we want to say. Uh, and that's that's just the case. You also wanted to talk about the fact that they keep pointing to the permanent fund as a way of taking the money and comparing the distributional impact on Alaskans. Well, yeah. So, so the permanent fund is calculated based upon earnings from the permanent fund uh, uh, revenue uh, from the revenue from the from the, the investments of the permanent fund. That's how that's how the permanent fund dividend is calculated. It has nothing to do with with uh, uh, the permanent fund dividend itself has nothing to do uh, with uh, uh, with with what we're getting off of oil. Now, a quarter of the of the of the uh, uh, royalties do go to the permanent fund dividend and are invested in the permanent it, it go to the permanent fund and are invested in the permanent fund but they are they are dwarfed by the by the amount that the permanent fund is is being fed anymore by the uh, by by the earnings stream I mean the 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 last last year the amount of royalties that went to the permanent fund was like 350 million dollars the amount of earnings that the permanent fund generated and that were reinvested back into the back into the permanent fund was in excess of three billion dollars, more than more than ten times. So, it's um, they're 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 making arguments about the permanent fund dividend that also aren't true. There's a, there's another thing, uh, another op-ed uh, that uh, uh, again sp uh, is spinning another story. It's an op-ed that appeared in the Anchorage Daily News. Again, it may be appearing in other newspapers around the state. Uh, it's authored by Joe Shearhorn, who's the, the chairman of uh, Northrum, and Jim Jansen, uh, who together are running this operation called Keep Alaska Competitive. Uh, it's an op-ed that appears in the ADN uh, over the weekend. It says, ballot measure one would hurt Alaska, not oil companies. And, and it comes down to an argument um, that, that says this. Alaska already has the highest government take of all the states at low oil prices and among the highest tax rates in the world. I'm not going to argue with it. It's not true, but I'm not going to argue with that part. Here's the next sentence. Increasing taxes by $1 billion per year will make Alaska uncompetitive and will reduce or eliminate new investment in our state. It's the $1 billion per year. Last week, uh, during the uh, uh, debates on Prop 1 that are required by uh, the ballot measure statute. The ballot measure statute says the lieutenant governor has to host uh, debates between the the pro and the con side 
uh, on uh, whatever ballot measures are out there. Last week it was Prop One, uh, and last week during the during that uh, during that discussion, uh, Oil was was continually tweeting and, and commenting. Uh, on on the on the statements being made by the yes on one advocates about how much revenue um, uh, the prop one would raise and and the advocates were wrong also they were saying it would raise a billion dollars uh, and they were they're doing that based upon past oil prices uh, and past production levels which right. is the wrong way to do it right but, but that but that's how they were doing it but then on Friday on Friday as part of this tweet attack. On Friday, uh, uh, Alaska Headlamp, which is a publication from uh, the Alliance, uh, t- tweeted out uh, what they called the Friday fact check, uh, and they were fact checking checking what uh, uh, what uh, what uh, the Prop One advocates had said during the week. And here's what they said uh, about this one billion dollar uh, uh, revenue claim. Footnote: There won't be 1.1 billion dollars in tax revenue at current prices and production levels. There will be about two hundred and fifty million dollars. So on the same week weekend that that Shearhorn and Jansen are writing this op-ed that says increasing taxes by one billion per year will make Alaska uncompetitive, that the other are another arm of oil, the the alliance, is out there admitting that Prop One will only raise about two hundred and fifty million dollars uh, in revenue again. What's what's going on is both sides are trying to, you know, using big numbers and big statements. Murkowski's statement about uh, about amendment, for example, they're they're using these big statements to sort of pivot off and um, and say, you know, Prop One is just a, a horrible horrible thing to do, uh, and it's going to have all these adverse impacts. While at the same time, uh, uh, the Constitution in the case of Murkowski's statement. And the alliance, in the case of, of Keep Alaska Competitive statement, are admitting that that's not, are, are saying that that's not true, uh, and and that the numbers are are uh, are, are much lower than what uh, than what everybody's saying. Here's the here's the point about Prop One. Prop One is a piece of the solution to to our fiscal problem, and it's a piece that that helps the PFD by reducing the amount of the PFD cut or other revenue. That's going to have to be raised to close the fiscal gap uh, if, uh, uh, if if Prop One is, is isn't passed. It's not it's not the be all and end all. It's not it's neither the be all and end all in terms of solving our fiscal crisis, nor is it the be all and end all in terms of having this horrible adverse impact that the, that the no on one people are claiming. It's a piece. It's a two hundred and fifty million dollar piece, and if it grows beyond that, if it turns into something different than what it actually is. The legislature has the authority under the Constitution to amend it right then and there. They don't have to wait two years. They don't have to wait 30 seconds. They have the authority to amend it uh, right then and there. So th- there's, just this, this, there's just this hysteria going on on both sides about, about Prop 1, overstating what it's doing, understating what you can do to correct it. Um, and it's just it's very frustrating. We need... We need to get to the facts. People need to be voting on the actual facts uh, in terms of both what the Constitution says and in terms of what the dollar impact is uh, instead of these hysterical numbers that uh, that uh, both sides are spinning out. Well, and I think this just reminds me of one thing, Brad, that somewhere in the middle there, there is the truth, right? I mean, we get both sides that are spinning outrageous tales in one direction or another, but in the middle there somewhere is the truth. And I think your point is valid in saying that, you know, at any time after this gets enacted, it can be changed. And it can be changed through the public process, which, of course, is one of the other things that people are concerned about is changing these tax laws and everything else. And then, uh, you know, thinking, well, we can't we can't touch it for two years and uh, and we're worried about it when the ca- fact is is that it can be changed immediately if the legislature has the political will to take it up. Exactly. What Prop 1 really does is put oil taxes on the table. I mean, everybody, a lot of people say, well, we'll address oil taxes next year. Well, we've been saying that for the last five years now. Uh, and there are tweaks that, 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 that should have been made to oil taxes. You and I have talked about on previous shows. Um, this this is a different way of doing the tweak, but it's a tweak, two hundred fifty million dollar uh, tweak uh, to oil taxes. If people want to do the tweak differently, 
they can come into the next legislature and do the tweak uh, differently and get get about uh, get about the the same result. Uh, but it put it puts oil taxes on the table. It 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 says to the legislature, you are going to deal with oil taxes. Uh, and if you don't, here's a backstop. Prop one is the backstop of how we're going to deal with it. But you are going to deal with oil taxes. It it takes off the table the legislature's ability to ignore the issue yet again this coming legislature. So that's what really that's what Prop one does. It it contributes to part of the fiscal solution, and it has the people of Alaska saying to the legislature, you will deal with oil taxes next year, um, and 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 avoids a situation in which the legislature lets it so- slide yet again. Well, and I guess my bigger question before I let you go here for this segment is. Uh, you know this this uh, this commentary by the by the Alaska Headlamp, which is from the uh, Industry Alliance, the oil company Industry Alliance, uh, where they say, well, it doesn't really bring in a billion; it only brings in two hundred and fifty million. Doesn't that undercut their own argument to say we've got a multi-billion-dollar industry in Alaska, and two hundred and fifty million out of all of that is, uh, you know, it's not chump change, but it's also, uh, you know, available for what's on the table. It's not nearly as devastating as many of these ads make it out to be. Exactly right. Two hundred fifty million dollars is three percent of of is a three percent increase in industry costs. It is the same increase in industry costs that the industry itself projects in inc- increased transportation costs, pipeline uh, and shipping costs uh, over the next two years. And and you don't hear the industry, you know, going off on a tangent about oh my God, we can't stand these increased transportation costs. We're going to have to shut in production. It's the same increase. The, the amount is the, is the same increase, so it's uh, it it does undercut uh, oil's argument. It's and it undercuts the the op ed that uh, that Shearhorn and uh, and uh, Jansen ran uh, uh, over the weekend. It is a, a moderate step at current oil prices. It is a moderate step as part of our fiscal solution. And I, you know, I'm just I'm I'm disappointed that oil is fighting it uh, in the way they are. Uh, because essentially what oil saying is, you know, as part of the don't tax me, don't tax you, tax that guy behind the tree, oil is essentially saying we don't want to be taxed. Uh, the top 20% are saying we don't want to be taxed. Well, who's going to pick up, who's going to pick up the burden then? And, and they're both trying to shove it to middle and lower income Alaska taxpayer or middle and lower income Alaska families through uh, increased PDF, PFT cuts. I think Larry does bring up a, 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 uh, an interesting aspect of this, Brad. <laughs> Larry says Prop 1 has at least one aspect that does not have anything to do with state income. The Alaska legislature does not need public access into the books of any company, is what he says. What say you? Well, the Alaska legislature doesn't even have private access into the books now. I mean, that's, that's, that's part of the problem. They, they, can audit, they can audit the tax returns, but use that, only, use that information only for purposes uh, of, of auditing the tax return. So... In terms of in terms of try, the the Alaska legislature itself trying to analyze what uh, what impact increased taxes would have uh, on uh, uh, on on the industry, the Alaska I mean the the legislature is sort of shooting in the dark. Analysts are shooting in the dark uh, because you don't have access to, uh, to to the cost data. What what Prop One is saying about that is look, it's it's on public lands. It's using public. Uh, a public resource to develop uh, uh, to, to to produce these profits, the public who owns the resource ought to have access to information about what it costs to develop the resource. So when the public is trying to to negotiate terms, as we do through through the tax uh, system, and when the public's trying to negotiate terms, the public ought to know. I, I don't I, I don't know that. Uh, I mean, Prop One can be amended. So if there is a big concern about information being made public uh, from the standpoint of a, of a competitive aspect, uh, maybe that's one of the things the, the legislature could amend. But, uh, but, but there is a problem in terms of the legislature not being able to have solid information uh, about what, what it's costing industry to develop the public resource uh, when, the, when the legislature is trying to uh, trying to develop uh, its tax system, it, it, it's sort of—I mean, the legislature is sort of shooting blind uh, in that situation, and the analysts are shooting blind. Well, and this has been part of the problem for years. I mean, even back in the day, uh, uh, you know, when we were under ACES and previous tax regimes, is that the Department of Revenue was constantly playing catch up 
uh, you know, they've got a handful of people working in the, you know, kind of the auditing department. I don't know what you would officially call it, but the auditing department of the Department of Revenue. And the oil companies have got, you know, whole floors of accountants and lawyers who are good at putting all these things together. I mean, there was a backlog and there was a statute of limitations on some of those. They could only go back so many years uh, to look at these taxes. And they were constantly behind because they didn't have all the competitive information and everything else. And they didn't have the ability to keep up with what the oil companies were putting together yet. I mean, we still saw... Uh, in the past, you know, there were there were there was litigation over property taxes and everything else based on values and revenues. And uh, I mean, they were constantly getting dinged for, you know, 60 million here, 30 million here, 90 million here over the years because it, and they they counted that as, I guess, good uh, business practice because they got to hold on to the money for a little bit longer. Uh, and so I guess it makes a little bit of sense if you have to be able to audit it to be able to have access to some of that information. Well, yeah, and you and you do have access to that information on an audit. What what the concern here is when you're setting new tax rates, like we're trying to do now, or you're setting new net is setting new terms. Uh, you really you're, you don't know uh, what the what the industry's costs are, and and while you might understand that if the industry was was operating on privately owned lands uh, and 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 it was a private resource that that we were that we that we were dealing with. Here they're operating on public lands. They're operating on state of Alaska lands, and for the for the landowner, in essence, not to not to have access to the costs of of the operations on his lands, I think is I, I, I think the Prop One people have a good point. Now, you know whether whether it that information should be just kept to the legislature and kept to its analysts and not not disclosed in a public fashion so that there's competitive consequences, maybe so. Uh, and that's a nuance, frankly, that again the, the the prop can be amended within two years. But I, I think it makes actually I think it makes a much better process for the legislature and for analysts to have access to to that cost information because they will come up with much better ideas of how to appropriately take money, uh, how to appropriately appropriately share. Uh, uh, the revenues from from the resource, as opposed to what we have now, where the state's just sort of flying blind. David actually throws some good ideas in the chat room. Uh, this is more about state spending, but I think it's interesting. You can give me a quick comment, Brad. We got about less than a minute here. He says, "How about auditing the state's K twelve system for return on investment? How about selling the Alaska Aerospace Corporation? Do away with the Alaska Energy Authority. Make the Mental Health Trust Fund uh, fund itself." By selling its properties, why focus on private economy when the focus should be on the government economy? You got about thirty-five, forty seconds. Well, he's talking about the spending side, and certainly we ought to be focusing on the spending side. And certainly, uh, the audits that, that that Mr. Boyle has recommended, uh, not only there but but in previous discussions, are are well worth pursuing. But that doesn't mean just because you ought to be focusing on the on the spending side doesn't mean you also don't have to focus on the revenue side. <clears throat> Probably a subject we're going to get into in the second segment. Yep, we're, we're going to dive right into that. Welcome back to the program, The Michael Duke Show. Common sense, liberty-based, free thinking thought and discussion. It's what we do uh, every day right here. And every Tuesday we bring Brad on. Uh, I've always enjoyed Brad. Brad and I don't always agree, but I think he brings good discussions to the table. But some of the folks in the chat room have, uh, all, you know, obviously uh, had some uh, ant- antipathy towards Brad on some of his statements. And so I thought I'd bring up some of the bigger ones that continue to come up uh, and and to talk specifically about them. Now, we're going to be covering some old ground because Brad has has answered these. Uh, in the past, but I want to give him a chance to expound on it in a full segment here and talk about it. I think first and foremost, Brad, what most people have a hard time with is the fact that uh, over the last, and this has changed because uh, prior to this, you and I were talking about sustainable budgets as far as bringing the spending down. I remember our first discussions when we were talking about uh, bringing state spending down to $3.9 billion dollars. Uh, as uh, as that sustainable level, 4.1, and then back to 3.9 as they continued to creep away from it. But over the course of the last couple of years, you've changed and uh, and uh, y- you've changed your position in in talking about it uh, to the point where you said, "Look, we've got to explore this idea of potentially having a tax, not advocating that we absolutely must, but that we have to have a tax on the table at least for discussion because the whole thing cannot be bridged." by one 
single uh, single point. So let me let me basically paraphrase what many people say. I'm sick and tired of Brad talking about taxes all the time. If we can't talk about the spending, taxes should never be on the table until we get the spending under control. What says Brad Keithley? Well, Michael, there's three things that have that have driven the course of my discussion over the past decade. One is we haven't brought spending under control. No, no. As many times as you and ta- you and I have talked about it on the show, as many times as I've written about it, and as I've said before, you can go back to the October 2012 uh, uh, Anchorage Daily News. Look at the op-ed page pages, and you'll see a piece by me that says the party's over. It's time to cut spending. That's at a time when when many people, uh, uh, both that comment on Facebook and and frankly listen to this show, we're still saying we need to spend more. Uh, uh, I was I was talking about cutting spending in 2012, the, but the fact is over the over the last decade we haven't cut spending, and and at some point you've got to face up um, to that reality. Uh, the second the second piece of it is we've we've run out of savings. I mean during the last decade you could I could say we need to cut spending. We can go on a glide path. We need to do this. We need to do that. And we had the safety net of the, the constitutional budget reserve and the statutory budget reserve sitting underneath us so that we had time to do a glide path. And we had time uh, to bring spending down uh, uh, in steps uh, and, and, and get it under control. The, the savings were there uh, to cushion us. Uh, we've run out of savings. Not only did we not cut spending over the last decade, we've run out of savings. So we have no cushion underneath us anymore. We're operating – we're out over the Grand Canyon – uh, without without a safety net setting setting underneath us, uh, and so the the option of a glide path or the option of talking about bringing spending down, not really doing it, putting it off another year and talking about it again, those days are gone, because we don't have we don't have uh, 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 safety net sit, sitting underneath us, and the third thing, and, and this is the thing that I don't think people have grasped uh, as well as as they as well as they should. Um, and and it's more somewhat of a recent phenomena um, uh, that that we're dealing with, uh, but it's but it's a very real phenomena that's made even more important by the fact we don't have savings, and that is over the last two years revenues have dropped like a rock. Now we're all familiar with what happened in 2014 with the drop in oil prices and the drop in revenues. I mean that's and that and that really added some fuel to the fire of 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 bringing spending down. But what people don't really what people what people aren't really factoring in is over the last couple of years, revenues have dropped have dropped again, and 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 so we're not facing a situation we're not even facing the situation that Governor Dunleavy had when he came into office in uh, in in 2018 after the election of 2018 and had his first budget uh, in 2019. Then uh, the revenues uh, that he that he had underneath him were about 3.1 billion dollars. He added 400 million dollars by diverting uh, uh, some local property taxes uh, uh, to the state, and that gave him a revenue stream of about 3.5 billion dollars. That 3.1 billion dollars uh, that he had as revenues uh, in in 20, uh, uh, 2019 or 2020 um, is now 2.2 billion dollars in 20. 2021 is 2.2 billion dollars. In 2022, it's 2.3 billion dollars. It's it's 800 million dollars less. So it's we've not only have we not cut spending over the last decade, not only have we run through savings over the last decade, but but the revenues are are, are dropping away from us rapidly. I mean, they've dropped away from us rapidly over the last two years. So it, I I could I could go on the program and I could talk about, yeah, cut spending, cut spending, cut spending. But that's not a solu- that is not the whole solution. That is part of the solution, but it's not the whole solution. We, we, even if we did uh, exactly what Governor Dunleavy proposed in 2019, we don't get there. We're still um, uh, $800 million uh, short uh, of being where, we, being where we need to be. So it's, I, I feel a responsibility I mean, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets is a, is a project to promote a sustainable budget. Right. Um, and and if you're not getting it from the – if you're not going to get sustainability from the cutting side, and we're not, and if you're not going to get sustainability from being able to fill in uh, during a – while you're cutting with uh, with savings, and we're not anymore, 
And if you're not going to get sustainability because the revenue stream uh, is falling away, you got you got to do something about that. Well, and it, and that's why over the last couple of years, as as you as I've seen these forces developing, as I've seen the failure to cut, as I've seen the the evaporation of savings, and as I've seen uh, in the last few years uh, the drop away, the additional uh, drop in revenues. Uh, you've got to talk about a, 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 a real solution, not just a sort of a, a half solution of cut, 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 cut. you got right. to talk about a real solution. Well, and you put out a, a slide that talked about balancing next year's budget with one way forward. And I'm, I'm going to put it up on the screen because I think it points out uh, exactly what we're talking about here, that this is not a single – it can't be a single faceted – it's got to be a multifaceted approach. It can't be a unified one single thing. There's no magic bullet that fix this. Uh, one of them, you know, it talks about incremental re- revenues from oil going up, incremental revenues if Prop 1 gets passed, incremental revenues from restructuring the PFD, uh, and then incremental new revenues. And, and I think the bottom line here is what people don't understand is you're talking about new taxes, but the bottom line is, is that there's going to be a tax one way or the other. They're either going to tax us as they have been through our dividend cuts or there's going to be some alternative form which hits more of Alaskan citizens across the board equitably. And then, of course, you include spending cuts in this. But, I mean, it, it has to be a multifaceted approach. i got 90 seconds, Brad. Well, that's an, that's an excellent example of, of, of what we're talking about. I mean, let's take spending to 20%. Let's take it to 30%. You're still not balancing the budget. You've still got to come up – with other revenues. So we, we're just, I, I'm just trying to deal with reality uh, as I talk about this issue. And I think that is the important part. I mean, again, here's the reality that people continue to not face. I think that people continue to cry, well, we just need to cut. We just need to cut. I'm on board the cut train. I want you to cut. The problem is we've been saying you need to cut. I've been saying it for 20 years in this program. You and I have been talking about it for the last eight years on this program. And nobody, you know, the, the track record is that it hasn't happened. And I think that's why we've moved on to the second phase to say, well, we've gone too far. There's that, that you know, no, no-go no point where you can't go back. You've got to move beyond, and this is the solution. This is the whole point that I've been making this whole time. We've been trying to get the legislature to cut for years. Now, granted, we've got a whole new crew going down there, right? We've got 11 new legislators are going to show up because seven – uh, seven got unelected and four didn't run for re-election. So we're going to have 11 new legislators show up down there. Is it enough? I hope so. But we have to have specificity in the cuts. Otherwise, we're going to be in big trouble. And this this slide that's up on the screen, I think, says it all. Right now, we are filling a big chunk of that gap with a tax. The tax is on the PFD. And, and if people don't acknowledge that we're already being taxed, We can't even – I don't think we're even talking on the same playing field at this point if people can't admit that we're already being taxed. Any discussion on another type of tax is either an alternate or that people are just ignoring the fact that we're already being taxed on it. Yeah, Michael, it's – it it is – it is – if we had elected these legislators, if we'd had this revolt back in 2012, as frankly I tried to – encourage at the time in 2014 as frankly i tried to encourage at the time in 2016 as frankly you know we tried to encourage at the time in 2018 as frankly we tried to encourage if we'd had it while we still had savings and before the, and before the revenues fell away um i would feel i would feel yeah okay let's try cutting because we got savings to support it uh as as we go through this the the fact is we're a decade too late to to have a to have a, a spending cuts only um, approach. Uh, we we can we used up all the savings. We used up 16, 17, depending on whether on how you count the SBR. We used up nearly twenty billion dollars in savings over the past decade, waiting for Godot, waiting for you know a, a legislature that would finally come in and make these cuts. It never came. And now, yes, maybe we've got enough people to be able to do it, uh, but but we don't have any we don't have any savings sitting underneath us anymore. Uh, and we're facing a situation where uh, revenues have fallen away as well. And we never cut spending uh, uh, back in the day when we could have, and now the, the gap is just huge. So it's it's great to have these legislators show up. I wish we'd done it in 2012, 2014, 2016, 2018. But we didn't, and we used savings in sp- instead, and savings is now all gone. 
The uh, Of course, the other argument that we didn't get to, the second question I get all the time, is why would I want to give the government more money when they've been so uh, inept with the money that we've given them so far, the money that they've taken so far from oil revenues and spent it willy-nilly, which I think is a viable question because, as we said, there's been no political will to cut. They spent like, you know, drunken teenagers with mama's credit card. And, I mean, why would we want to give them more? Shouldn't we starve the beast? That same chart answers that question. The government has our PFDs. Unfortunately, they don't come to us separately. They go through government. And, and government's just going to take it. I mean, the government's, we, they've demonstrated for the past five years that they're just going to take whatever part of the PFD they want. So the question isn't, isn't is, is, is government going to take money? They've already taken it. They're going to continue to take it through the PFD. The question is how they take it. And, 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 and my problem with the PFD, as we've talked about time and time and time again, it has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy, and it is, has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families. It shoves the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families. The top 20% pay a trivial amount. Non-residents pay nothing. So there, there's not really a question, there's not really an issue of can we starve the beast, can we keep government from taking money. They're taking it. They're taxing us. They're taking it out of the PFD. The question is, can we do it more equitably, more fairly, and with a lower adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy? And there are ways to do that. Right. Um, somebody, uh, Charlie, in the chat room says, I want to see some specific progress on cutting before giving any additional money. <laughs> the problem is, is that, of course, we're not going to do it in a single year, right? And what happens in the meanwhile? They continue to take uh, they continue to take, and they will take more. And as you said, they could take all of, of the PFD. Yeah, the, the fallacy of that question, the, pro, the reason I chuckle when I hear that question is any additional money. They're taking money. They can take up to $2 billion out of the PFD, and there's some people who are advocating uh, to do that. And that, frankly, would balance their, come very close to balancing their budget. Uh, and they're very willing to do that. The question isn't taking additional – the question isn't providing them additional money. It's substituting – a more equitable, lower impact approach to raising money than what than what's happening uh, under the PFD, and and that's that's you know I understand I understand the, the 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 desire to see cuts first, but but folks they're taking your money now. Well, that's, and they're going to continue to take your money. Yeah, I think that's the point here is that people are are assuming that they're going to have some kind of choice in this matter. Well, I don't want to give them any more money through taxes until they cut their spending. They're going to take it all. And they, like you said, they could take it all. They could take the entire dividend and kick that can down the road a little bit further. Uh, again, de- you know, decimating middle to lower income Alaskan families at the cost, uh, you know, to to the to the benefit of those who are in the higher income. I mean, it, it, it's not like we have a choice. They're going to take it from us. And the question is, is there a more equitable approach? And frankly, Michael, as you and I have talked on the show, a more equitable approach that took money also from the top 20% and took money also from oil oil companies would have the effect of, re- of reducing costs faster. Why? Because the top 20% would suddenly become advocates of cutting costs. Right now they're in the position, Natasha's in the position of saying, I don't care. Why, why do listeners think there's this alliance between the top 20%, Jennifer Johnson, Kathy Giesel, Natasha von Imhoff, and the Democrats? Because a deal's been made that we won't cut spending, we won't we won't force you to cut spending as long as you don't tax us, as long as you don't as long as you don't tax the tw- top twenty percent. You start taxing the top twenty percent, and you're going to get spending cuts. You start putting oil's uh, nose in the game uh, through Prop One, so they have to contribute some. They're going to put their lobbyists on getting spending cuts. Yeah. Right now, neither one of them really we- care. Yeah, because they're not really having to pay the consequences of over of overspending. All that's been shoved to middle and lower income Alaska families. So if you want spending cuts, got to you, you need you need a you need a more equitable approach. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thank you so much. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.